Thanks, Steve. And uh, thank you for the excellent teaching, uh, Tommy, and also uh, Jack, wherever Jack is. That was a great teaching. And for Jack particularly, we've been showing the, the posters for the Teach the Word conference. You guys have been showing those in the churches, so we have that, that poster if you're familiar with that. I just dig that look, and so I thought I should try that on. We did our own poster, and um, I don't know. I just <laughs> would, that, would that work? I don't know. I, could I borrow that, Jack, wherever you are? I don't know. I'm uh, just joking, but I do, I do show that because it's going to make a great illustration on what I want to talk about today. If you turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, put on your seatbelts because I have 30 minutes to go through a ton, um, and so I'm going to be talking fast. I want to first take a look at the nature of spiritual warfare and then take a look at specifically how this warfare is waged, sort of piggyback on some of the things that uh, Jack touched on. It is my deep, heartfelt conviction that the church as a whole desperately, desperately needs discernment <laughs> concerning spiritual warfare. There seem to me to be great extremes. You either have uh, the people who don't consider it all, they, they walk around like there's no war going on at all, or you have the other extreme where everything and everyone uh, they encounter uh, could be a satanic. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a demon around every corner. I think the passage in 1 Timothy really helps us to see what really is happening. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now the, expirit, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. In this passage, Paul is writing about the cause of apostasy. Apostasy is described in this passage as uh, departing from the faith. And that phrase, will depart from, is one word in the Greek, a feast day me, it means to depart from, it means to fall away from, but it really means to remove oneself from a position originally occupied into another place. A feast day me is where the, we get this word apostate from. It refers to a purposeful, a deliberate departure from a former position. And here he says that some will depart from what? The faith. The faith. This refers to Christian Jack said it, doctrine. It is the content of what we believe. In the book of Jude, which was written to the warn the church of apostates as well, he says that we need to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. You see, it's the faith, it's the content of Scripture. It is doctrine which was delivered to the saints. It's that truth from which people fall away. But they don't depart from the faith and fall into some void. What they do is they, they depart from the faith and they attach themselves to something resembling truth. It's a distortion of the truth, like the original picture of Jack and my cheap knockoff. <laughs> we are constantly in Scripture exhorted to remain in, abide in the doctrine. Look at 2 John 1.9. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. You look at another passage in 1 Timothy 6, 3. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, look at the description of this person. He is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy and strife and reviling and evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men and corrupt minds, and note it, destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. These are harsh warnings. Withdraw from someone who comes to you with a different doctrine. Don't even greet them. Why is this so dangerous? Because what you have to recognize is the source of their teaching. If it's contrary to the doctrine of Christ, then it is a demonic doctrine. They're not simply coming to you with some worldly philosophy, some new ideology. It is satanic. Look at our passage again. The Spirit expressly says in a latter time some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving doctrines, deceiving spirits, sorry, and doctrines of demons. All the false teaching that we see in the world, all false religions, all those who teach a different doctrine, all the worldly ideologies and beliefs, it's ultimately demonic. And if you're toying around with these things, you are in actuality toying around with the demonic. 
And that's why leaders of the church are called to be sound in doctrine. Titus 1.9 says that we are to be holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. A leader of the church must use, what is it? Sound doctrine. Why? Because you're battling demonic doctrine. Demons, fallen angels, they are the agents who energize all false teaching, all false religion, all the worldly ideologies and beliefs and the many things that even Jack has touched on. But here's what I want you to see. The reality is that people ultimately fall away because, note what it says, they give heed to deceiving spirits. That giving heed to is prosecho in the Greek. It means to cling to or to devote themselves to. Then it's not just listening to it. They cling to these things. They depart from the faith. They ultimately do so because they cling to, devote themselves to deceiving spirits. And when you do, you attach yourself to a seducing spirit. Your Bible might say that word. Deceiving there is planos, where we get our word planet. It's not fixed. It's wandering. It's roving. And that's the idea. It's misleading. It's meant to seduce you and lead you away from the truth. That is the nature of that kind of teaching. It's corrupt. It's deceitful in its nature. The same word for deceiving is used in 2 John 1, 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And so we have to abide in the doctrine of Christ. We've got to be very, very careful when we encounter anything that is contrary to God and to His Word. It's all deception. The church has always been in danger of demonic doctrine. Paul was very concerned for the church's related to doctrine. And I want to take you to a passage in 2 Corinthians 11. I have the verse for you to begin with. Verse 3, he says this, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you've not received, or a different gospel, which you've not accepted, you may well put up with it. That's a scary verse. Paul's concern for the Corinthians is that they could easily be deceived, that their minds could be corrupted just as Eve was. But what's most interesting is that he equates that with believing in another Jesus, in a different gospel, and receiving a different spirit. I want to take you to Genesis chapter 3. It was mentioned in there, uh, the great uh, temptation of Eve, because I want to look first and foremost here at this um, really strategy that Satan uses to kind of begin with, um, when you look at Genesis chapter 3, verse, verse 1, you have the serpent coming on the scene right away. In verse 1, it says this, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You, know, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now at this point, what you have to recognize is there's no written word of God. But there is the spoken word of God, isn't there? That has already existed. God spoke his commands to Adam, and Adam then related them to Eve. So his words were first. That is key because for people to be deceived away from the truth, the truth has to be there to begin with. The truth has always been here. People are deceived away from it. And look at the truth in chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die." So there are the words of God first and foremost. Secondly, notice that the serpent was cunning. So he's deceitful. He's sly. He's crafty. He didn't come in his actual form, introducing him, himself as Satan. Hello. Good to meet you. 2 Corinthians 11 tells us that all of Satan's emissaries come in camouflage. In verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no wonder... For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. This is Satan. The serpent is Satan, just like Tommy said in Revelation chapter 12. He's the serpent of old called the devil. Now, I want to look at the strategy of Satan here. The first thing you should notice, and uh, I think Tommy mentioned it, is the doubt that's um, put in her mind. Has God indeed said? Now, it's not a, a sin to doubt God. Read the Psalms. Doubting and take, is, takes, takes place all the time. But that must very quickly be replaced with truth. If you stay in doubt too long, you end up where? With an evil heart of unbelief. That's what Hebrews 3.12 says. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living 
God. You may not depart from God with doubt instilled in your mind, but it can lead to that. Charles Spurgeon admitted that his peculiar uh, temptation to, to him, specific to him, was unbelief. He never gave in to that temptation, but he battled doubt constantly all through his life. And just like the doubting question Satan raised in Eve's mind, did God really say? We have these kind of things coming to us today. Does God really say that? Did he really say you could, you could eat from every tree of the garden? I mean, what kind of God is he? It sounds like he's kind of holding out on you. If you're really God's child, he'd give you whatever you want to eat. I think we need to recognize that we too can feel that temptations to question God if we don't go to doctrine, if we don't go to his word. I think it often comes to us when we experience extreme difficulties in life, don't you? You, you maybe you're going through a period of sickness or loss, maybe it's financial pressures or um, marital or relational struggles and hardships, and you began to go, is God really always good? Always? Does he really do all things for the good of those who love him? Because this doesn't feel real good right now. Is he really always faithful? Because we began to feel overlooked as his child. We feel uncared for. We feel slighted by the way that God has treated us. And so we can begin to doubt him and not take him at his word, which is why it's so important to get into the word. Because what's his word say about, say, his faithfulness? Look at Lamentations 3, 22. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. It is great. And he's merciful to us every single minute of every single day. We must be careful about doubt because it can lead to denying his word. And that was really the next step for Satan in his strategy. Look at Eve's response. She quickly sort of... Um, clarifies for Satan what the rules were. And the woman said in verse 2 to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. I know she had, uh, nor shall you touch it, but I honestly think that was the man relaying the command to the wife, right? Um, yeah, he said not to eat it, but listen, woman, don't even touch it, okay? Don't go near it. And so she says, yeah, I'm not even supposed to touch the thing. Anyway, so he, she tells the rules to them and then what is God's, uh, Satan's response here in verse, uh, verse 4? Look at this. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now that is an outright denial of the truth of God's word. All you have to look, uh, do is look back at chapter 2, verse 17, and it's an outright denial. Satan's goal is to move us from doubting, which can happen to us as Christians, but can move us from doubting to denying him. And listen, denying him is the way of the false teachers, there are people in the church begin to doubt and then begin to deny him, and they spread that stuff around. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, we're told this. There were also false prophets among you, among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. But that's, that's denial of the truth, and it doesn't stop there. Again, you don't leave the truth to a nothing, to a void. It's replaced with a distortion of the truth. And Satan distorts it in verse 5. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, that sounds good. There's an element of truth in there, isn't it? Your eyes will be opened. Uh, you won't really be like God. It's twisted. It's distorted. And that's what these people do. Second Peter 3 16 describes these people as untaught and unstable people, twisting to their own destruction as they do all the rest of the scriptures. Now, why did Eve fall for these things? Because she lacked discernment. Like Paul said, Satan's craftiness deceived her mind, and her mind became corrupt. And look at verse 6. She now looked at that forbidden tree with new eyes. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. This is tragic, but it's also very enlightening. And I think it helps us to understand how we can protect ourselves from going down this same path. How can we protect ourselves from deceivers? How can we um, be more discerning as Christians? Well, the easy answer is get in the Word. No doctrine, abide in truth. But here's the thing, I'm going to take a spin on this because Scripture makes this clear. I don't think that it's obviously the obvious doctrinal errors like uh, denying the Trinity, um, denying the um, divinity of Christ. I, I, those are obvious ones. I, I think it's more the subtle things. Satan's subtle. 
And I'm going to tell you this. You're going to stand with me on this, okay? All spiritual warfare is going to come to you through the conduit of your own sinful flesh. We are redeemed. We're made new. Amen. We have new, new creations in Christ, but we still have the sinful flesh. And Paul recognized this in Romans 7, 20 uh, to 23. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that, is, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, that's his flesh, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members, his flesh. Paul sees a war going on inside himself, and that's why a few verses later he says, uh, with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul recognized the power of the sinful flesh, and so I want to take the remaining time today to give you really three things in which that flesh, which we all have, is sort of sustained, allowed to live in regards to spiritual warfare. It's sustained by three things. The first is our own sinful desires. We have sinful flesh, but we can suppress the sinful desires of the flesh. And James 1.13 says this, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his, what is it? Own (laughs) desires and enticed. It's our own desires that tempt us. Listen, folks, we can't blame Satan for everything. And then you might go, well, but then is this spiritual warfare really? Absolutely. Look at Galatians 5, 16. I say then, walk in the what? Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so you do not do the things that you wish. There is a war going on within you right now, within your bodies, between the spiritual and the physical And Paul says that we must, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body. So when we give in to temptation, we're rejecting the leading of what? The Spirit. And we're believing, to some degree, a demonic doctrine. To some degree. We ourselves do the doubting. We ourselves do the denying. We ourselves, we do the distorting. We might doubt that God and His Word and his spirit, and his church can truly satisfy our every need, and that we have everything we need for the life and godliness. That's what his word says. We deny the word which informs us that we've been bought with a price, and that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We distort the truth into a lie, telling ourselves that pleasure can be found elsewhere, and that God will actually approve of it. When we do that, we're not completely yielding ourselves to the leading of his spirit And let me touch on some things that we're seeing today and even things that have been around a long time. There are a lot of so-called Christians today that believe they can live in a moral life. Um, They can believe they can be in a same-sex relationship, and they can still be considered a Christian, a a Christ follower. They claim uh, love is love. Or maybe they get a little more scriptural and say, well, God is love. And God's love is bigger than human love. His love is able to accept all love because our love is limited. Our love is small. Well, is that what the Bible says about God's love? Yes, he's love, but because he's love does not mean that he ceases to demand holiness because he's a holy God. And his word clearly says in Matthew 5, 48, therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. He doesn't separate himself from all morality for the sake of love. In fact, how was God's love supremely demonstrated? Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's why Paul can say, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who, what? Loved me and gave himself for me. Yes, I would agree with them. God's love is bigger because only God could love his sinful, hateful enemies by dying for them. Another example, maybe just for believers, God's love also doesn't mean that he puts his children uh, into a bubble of protection uh, keeping them from, uh, uh, safe from all harm and, and disaster and, and difficulty and trials. He disciplines those he loves. And Hebrews 12 says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. 
God is treating you as sons. For what son is there to whom his father does not discipline? Uh, the difficulties of life are often the discipline of the Lord. And when he does that, he's treating us as sons. J.I. Packer, in his well-known book, Knowing God, speaks about God's love into these two areas. And he says this, God's love is stern, for it expresses holiness in the lover and seeks holiness for the beloved. Scripture does not allow us to suppose that because God is love, we may look to him to confer happiness on people who will not seek holiness or to shield his loved ones from trouble when he knows that they need trouble to further their sanctification. The truth of Scripture concerning God's love is, is, is doubted when we start believing things like that. It's distorted. It's denied. The leading of the Holy Spirit is rejected then for the leading of the flesh. The rule of Christ in our hearts is replaced with the rule of self. Make no mistake, your sinful flesh is a great conduit for spiritual warfare. It happens in the heart and in the mind. Secondly, it is fed and sustained by the world. 1 John 2, 15 and 16 says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world, as we heard already, is currently under the sway of the evil one. Satan is called the ruler of this world in John 12, 31. He's the God of this age that blinds the minds of unbelievers. And the entire world system is satanically energized. The things of the world are designed to feed into your sinful flesh. They come to us as a, a picture of goodness. They come to us as, as, as a picture of delight. But it is deceptive and it is evil. And I think we've had too long of a good period and have started to rely on sustenance from the world for spiritual things, which you have no right to rely on. The world has no concern for your sanctification, let me tell you. Remember back to Satan's appearance to Eve. He created doubt in her mind, then he denied the truth, and then he distorted it. And verse 6, notice Eve's looking at this tree now. That When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, now she's looking at what God said, don't touch, and she's looking at it and says, you know what, I bet it tastes really good. That fruit looks pretty good. What is he appealing to there? The lust of the flesh. That's what our flesh lusts for in this world. Everything that comes from Satan's world system is an appeal to your flesh, not to your what? Your spirit, which wages war against your flesh. And we know what the works or the fruit of the flesh are, don't we? They're listed in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, Sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. What a list. All happening. It's all been happening. That's the work of the flesh. You contrast that a few verses later with the work of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, right? What a, what a contrast. They're diametrically opposed to one another because the world system, Satan's world system, is opposed to Christ and his church. Look at Genesis 3, 6 again. Notice also that she saw it was pleasant to the eyes. Yes, it was forbidden to look at, but she looked at it and said, you know what? It looks pretty harmless. It looks natural. It looks normal. It's the eyes today that say, I see it. I want it. I'm going to get it. And we're on Amazon, and we're, <laughs> right, you get it right away. Your eyes are the window to your soul. Job, he said that he needed to make a covenant with his eyes that he wouldn't sin against God. Let me give you a, a, a great verse to tuck away. Psalm 119, 37, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. I think a lot of Christians are very care, careless with their eyes, particularly today. Get off your phones. Get off the internet. <laughs> Galatians 3, also going back to that, notice also that Eve looked at this tree and it was desirable to make one wise. She knew it was forbidden, yet it created a desire in her and it appealed to her, what, pride. Hey, it'll make me wise. I can be like God. And this is the pride of life. It isn't it interesting that people want to reintroduce their, their sex to God and look, at what, look what I created, God, and they call it pride. The Bible calls it the pride of life. 
and it comes from the world, and it comes from Satan. Now, all of this is deception. What she should have done is rejected it all as lies. It was not good for food because God had already determined what was good. It was sinful, a forbidden thing, and she should never looked upon it as pleasant to the eyes. And if it's something that has the potential to feed our pride, then it is dangerous. Let me give you an example of the pornography industry today. Rampant. And this is a great example. It takes something that's inherently good, sex between a man and a woman in the context of marriage. It takes it and places it in a forbidden context outside of the marriage. And that's wrong and it appeals to the lust of the flesh. And men and women watch it and it's pleasant to the eyes because they say, oh, it's good. It's natural. It's just human. It's harmless, which appeals to the lust of the eyes. But what does it do? It inflates the ego. It inflates pride. Something that God created as a sacrificial act of, of giving between two people is distorted into a selfish act of taking from anyone and everyone. It's the pride of life. That's just one example of myriad of ways in which this is satanically energized world is trying to appeal to your flesh. The final thing that feeds our sinful flesh is Satan himself. I don't want to disregard Satan. You do have an adversary. He does roam around. He does want to devour you. And Satan, I think, primarily seeks to use our circumstances to produce ungodly thoughts, ungodly behavior, ungodly um, attitudes and emotions. Consider the temptation of Jesus as a really good example. Matthew gives us the situation in Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry, the understatement of the century. So what was the circumstance in Jesus' life? He was hungry. But what is that? It's weak in the flesh. He had weakened flesh. Satan didn't come unto Jesus until after Jesus was weak in the flesh. When does Satan come to you? When we're tired. When we're sick. When we're emotionally drained. When we're already burdened and weak and weary, we're primed for a fall. How did Jesus withstand the temptation? Through the word. Doctrine. Satan said, oh, you're hungry, huh? Well, why don't you make some uh, bread out of these stones? Listen to me, I've got good advice for you. Listen to, to my doctrine. And Jesus answered him, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And what I love is he's quoting from Deuteronomy 8.3. There Moses is talking to the next generation of Israelites. They're about to march into the promised land. He is reminding them of why God allowed uh, the children of Israel to go through all the troubles that they did, allowing them to hunger. In fact, look at Deuteronomy 8, 2. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Why? To humble you, test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. See, it had a purpose. The purpose was to humble them, to remove pride, to remove self-sufficiency. It was a test of faithfulness and trust. And then verse 3, this is what he quotes from, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man should not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. See, Satan comes to us through the difficult circumstances that God is trying to use to cause us to trust him, to rely upon him and his word. And he tempts us to look for our own way out of the situation. And usually, I can tell you, in my experience, it's a dishonest way, an immoral way, or a sinful way because we just don't like difficulty. Remember Satan, or a messenger of Satan, sorry, came to Paul. He called it a thorn in the flesh. He asked God to remove it three times, whatever it was, and, and God didn't remove it. Instead, what was God, God's reply to him? 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast of my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. But see, that's just too difficult for us. We just want out of difficulty. And I think a lot of times we're just willing to do whatever it takes to get out. Are you in a difficult marriage? What has the world made very easy today? To get out of the marriage. Divorce. And boy, have we made that easy. And we bought into the lies of Satan today, the little lies of Satan that tell you that God would want you to be happy because you're one of his children, that he wouldn't want you to suffer, that he'd be more glorified if you divorce and marry someone who would bring him glory. I've heard all those things. 
And I just want to say, go to the Word of God and see what He says about it. Malachi, I hate divorce. Now, obviously, there are exceptions, and I don't mean to put anyone down that has gone through something like that, but the vast majority of marital situations I've encountered are people simply are simply not happy. <laughs> they think they deserve to be. Now, that's just one example. You see my point. Satan distorts the truth of God's Word. He gets us to believe in little lies, and it takes you away from the truth. And listen, anytime we go away from the truth and we start believing these little things, go back to the first part. What are you believing? A demonic doctrine. You're being influenced by deceiving spirits. Yes, we have all the big things happening in our world today, and they're pretty darn obvious even to people that aren't believers. I want to bring you to focus on the little things that are happening each and every day in your own eyes. But I want to end you with an encouraging thing, okay? How do we battle these things? Jack said it. You have an ally. In 1 John chapter 4, we have another great resource there, by the way. When you read 1 John 4, it's the test the spirits passage, which is another discernment uh, uh, um, test there for you. But right in the middle of these tests, we find this wonderful truth, and I'll end with this. 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. What are you relying on? The Holy Spirit who lives in you. And he's already overcome the world. So all we do is rest in that power. You are right, Jack. You cannot do it on your own. It is not in our own strength. And ultimately, bring you back to this, spiritual warfare is a battle over truth. It's a battle over doctrine. And Christians today, I think, believe a whole lot of untruth. The battleground is the sinful flesh, which one day we'll, we'll no longer have to deal with. Amen? Praise the Lord for that. But in the meantime, we have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in you, and he's greater than all these things. When we walk in the Spirit, we're not going to gratify the lust of the flesh because our sinful desires, the temptation of the world, and even Satan himself are powerless against the greater power that we possess. Amen. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for your word to us today. Lord, what a, what a great beginning to this day. I pray for your people, Lord, that you would... Help us all to truly take on board these truths, particularly in the, the world and the times we find ourselves living in, uh, Lord, exciting times, but also perilous times. If, if, if Christians are not discerning, may they draw back to the truth of your word, Lord. May we not uh, be dragged away. May we not be enticed. Lord, we also pray for your protection. We pray for your guidance. And may churches teach the word. That's why we're here, the Teach the Word Conference, to encourage that. We love you. We praise you. We pray that you'll continue to receive the glory. Do your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.